Rock 108. Hey, it's Ned hanging out another episode of Coffee and Quarantine where we're hanging out, drinking coffee, and live music is still not able to happen in its full super capacity. So these bands are all just hanging out at home, writing music, doing whatever they do, maybe playing Super Mario Brothers. I don't freaking know, dude. But the, I know that the one number one thing that they want to do, like, hey, we're in quarantine. We have to talk to that Ned guy at that Rock 108 station. That's their number one priority. Am I right, Kevin? At least that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, listen, coffee and rock and roll. I don't, you know, it used to be cocaine and rock and roll. Now it's coffee and rock and roll. I know it's kind of chill. I've got legendary singer Kevin Martin right here hanging out from Candlebox, dude. This is so awesome to have you. I've been listening to you for. I'm not gonna try and make you feel old. I know before we jumped on this interview, you're like hearing gray. I'm like, yeah, he's at that point where he's gray now, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm 51, dude. You know, listen, that's the only thing that gets me up anymore is coffee. You know yeah, what I dude. mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm drinking. There's like this place in Iowa called Scooter's Coffee. I don't know if it's like a franchise or something like that, but they make some pretty rad coffee, dude. Oh, I love Scooter's. I've been oh, you there. do? All right, cool. Oh, yeah. So maybe it is a big thing. I don't friggin' know, man. But, dude, it's, uh, I mean, where do I even begin? I've had plenty of great, amazing people on this show, and this, that you definitely top that list right now because I'm like, I love talking to people that have been around in the music industry from even the late 80s, the mid the 90s, of course, and all the way until now. I mean, songs like Far Behind, Cover Me, Candlebox, man, such a huge inspiration to so many people and bands out there. Um, and we could sit there and talk about that all day kind of thing. But my first thing, even before you jumped on the air here, is one of my favorite bands is Godsmack, right? And I realized that at one point uh, during Happy Pills, you had Shannon Larkin on, uh, <laughs> on your album. How was it kind of working with him during those early days of Godsmack, essentially, before he jumped into that band, of course? Well, we didn't have Shannon on the album. Um, okay. We had recorded Happy Pills with Dave Cruz, and um, Shannon toured with us after ah, gotcha. we went through All a right. bit of a turmoil in, in late, yeah, late 98. And um, so Barty, Barty and Dave left the band mid-tour, uh, mm -hmm. right before its spring run, yeah. which was always fun to do. And um, so I had to replace, uh, had to replace, you know, two members. So we, we got Rob Reddick, this kid um, who uh, our manager knew that was – from LA mm -hmm. studio cat and uh and then he, and then John Reese at the time was managing snot um and uh and of course um I think the lead singer unfortunately was killed in a in a car accident on the way to the studio and so yeah. Shannon was a part of that band and John's like listen I this kid Shannon Larkin from Ugly Kid Joe and I was like I know Shannon brilliant drummer John's like mm -hmm. we'll have him you know have him come down to the studio and see if he works out and uh and it was funny because you know, a lot of people, I mean, no, maybe do, don't, don't know that Shannon's mostly deaf in both ears from, you know, playing drums from the age of one till, oh, you know, oh. whatever now. Okay. So he, he started playing um, you with us in rehearsal and he was missing all the backbeats and all the uh, ghost notes and everything. And so I went over and I said, Hey man, listen, there's a lot of backbeats on this, you know, and the ghost notes and, he, and he's looking down at his toms. He's not hearing me. I was like, Hey Shannon, you know, I don't you know if you hear this or not, but there's like ghost notes. Mm -hmm. And he's still not looking at me. And then he turns and goes, oh, hey, were you saying something? I was like, oh, yeah, it's all about the oh, ghost man. notes. And he's like, I'm sorry, what? I said, ghost notes. He goes, oh, maybe John didn't tell you, but I'm pretty much deaf in both ears. Oh, man. Like, well, this is going to be great because Cannabox <laughs> is a totally dynamic band with a lot of grooves and stuff. But it yeah. ended up working out amazing. Shan is a brilliant drummer. And, and once, once I showed him that, because I'm a drummer as well, mm -hmm. once I showed him those patterns and the way it worked, he picked it up like that. And it was not a problem, but amazing drummer and an absolute joy to, to play with live and um, we actually just played in Fort Myers Florida uh, right before quarantine shut down and Shannon got up and played uh, 10,000 horses with us again which is you know pretty special like not only for us but like for the fans with the show yeah yeah I mean just kind of that collaboration and and you being saying that you're a drummer as well you know I gotta admit uh, being in a band myself years and years ago I'm more of a music guy just listener and fan now but drummers are very interesting people, man. And that's why I say, I mean, even like you said, Shannon, partially deaf and whatnot. I'm just like, and he's a drummer and these musicians, I mean, it even goes back to like the Beethovens, if you want to call it that. It's like, how the hell do these people have such a talent like you guys? And I'm just like, it, it blows my mind, man. Well, it's an interesting thing, you know, I mean, listen. Uh, it's probably best that he's in a band like Godsmack because there's not a lot of finesse going on there. <laughs> you know, but um, no offense, I mean, Godsmack, just, you know, not, not at all. I mean, they're just a brutally, you know, abusive rock and roll band. And I love that about them, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and Shannon, when mm -hmm. the two of them perform live together, he and Sully, it's just so cool, man. You know, I wish that, um, 
Am I losing you, Kevin? And we're, you know, we're, we're mostly known for our melodic uh, blues-based rock and roll. So um, I miss playing drums, and it's something that I wish I, I was able to do more. And, and I just I love that so much about Godsmack and what, what they've got going on. I think it's one of the coolest things ever. Yeah, well, hey, man, you're only, like you said, what, 50, 51? You still have plenty of opportunity to play more drums and bands, man. I don't see why not. <laughs> Come on, you can totally do it. I mean, hey, you've been doing this jam for quite a while now. I mean, it's time to get back behind the skins, dude. Well, you know, I, I think the, the, it's the process of kind of allowing yourself the time, you know, I, I mean, yeah. I, I just, I'm a father and I'm a husband and, and um, I mean, that's been, the, you know, honestly, the best thing about this quarantine is, is the fact that I've been home. I've been, you know, when, you, when you're a traveling musician, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're home one or two weekends a month and it's just not enough, you know, and it, you know, the re-entry in a relationship is really difficult. So this, this has been amazing. And I, I, I don't know if I would, even bothered to set up a drum set at my house and start playing again because I just I'm enjoying everything else that I'm doing you know I'm, I'm, I'm baking bread I'm, I'm building shit I'm cutting down trees and you know I'm doing those, those things that I'm supposed to do yeah. uh, as, a, as a homeowner and whatnot and I'm actually quite enjoying it so I, I don't know if I'm ready to take on another band I've got the gracious view I've got Le Projet with Morgan Rose which is another brilliant drummer yeah yeah uh, and I've got my other side project the high watts with my buddy Adam so that's enough music for, I think, one musician. <laughs> <laughs> You're staying busy. You know, that's, that's not a bad thing. You know, it's funny you point out the the family and the uh, the wife and home building and whatnot. I actually recently bought a house myself, um, and I have my first baby daughter popping up here in December, oh. man. So uh, Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm, I'm terrified, Kevin, man. I'm just like, what am I doing? <laughs> it's it, There's nothing to be afraid of. I mean, really, honestly, you won't hurt them. You won't break them. Um, <laughs> I mean, our son, when he was six months old, he, he somehow found a way to unclip himself in his stroller and fell out. I mean, I, we don't even know. Like, they're, they're, they can't even use their hands at that point. And, right. uh, you know, and he's fine. Well, I guess I think he's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're the most amazing things. You know, children, they bring such joy and and frustration and, and you know, uh, the, the worst part's going to be that first year. You're not going to sleep a lot, but yeah, just be there for you. Be there for you. There's actually a book uh, that a friend of ours did called um, uh, Dad's Know Best. And it's got a bunch of, uh, it's got a bunch of inspirational quotes and, and, um, and, and I guess um, ideas for new dads. Mm -hmm. And it's from everybody from Jerry Rice, uh, you know, from the 49ers. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Troy Aikman's in there. It's a, it's just a ton of you know guys that, that have had five children, six children, one child, uh, and it's and it really kind of you know opens your eyes to to what you should know about being a dad. And, and mm -hmm. you know most importantly, you've got to be there for your wife and, yeah. or your girlfriend or, or you know whatever it is because uh, they're you know the stuff that they go through emotionally is ten times what we even, you know right. It's, it's, they're the ones doing all the work at the end of the day. I mean, all the time. You know? Yeah. So, Building child, you'll building be, family. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, it's I was uh, I was talking to uh, Lejean Witherspoon. You know, uh, Seven Dust, obviously. Of course, yeah, yeah. And he's got a kid on the way too, and he's definitely one of those guys. He 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 posts on Instagram plenty of times of like, here's what my daughter's doing, here's this and all that. And he just seems like one of those rad dads. Like in his room, when we were chatting with him on Coffee and Quarantine, he had all these arcade games and all this stuff. And I'm just like you're that dad that's just having a good time. Like, look at all my nerdy shit. And the kids are just like, I don't care, dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Lejean's. I mean, he's a, and he's a great father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he loves his children and, you know, not only a great lead singer and a, and a great performer, but he's a really great father. And, and yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of rock star dads out there um, that, you know, I mean, what's the book, the other F word uh, that was written by a punk rock guy. And, it, you know, it really is about the responsibilities of, 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 you know, of men in their children's lives and the mm -hmm. importance of being a father. And, and, you know, it's, it's not that a lot of men don't want to do it. A lot of men just kind of are, are uh, maybe uh, a little bit like you afraid of that process. And yeah. it's nothing to be afraid of, man. It's, <laughs> it's a great thing. You'll, you'll be great.
But enough about that. Let's talk about my new single. Yes, but please, yes. I was about to say, we can sit here and talk about that stuff all day. But yes, please tell me. I was, that's what I was going to segue into, man. So what is Candlebox going on right now? What's happening with you guys? you got a brand new single. Tell us all about it. Yeah, we got the single out called Let Me Down Easy, uh, which I wrote with Peter Cornell, who's, uh, of course, Chris Cornell's older brother. Um, I've known Pete, you know, since the, since the 80s in Seattle. Um, and then we've got an album that's coming out sometime next year. We were trying to trying to get it out this past August, but uh, with COVID and everything, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're kind of sitting on it, hoping that Sony and, and Red will let us put it out in the first quarter. But the first single spot let me down easy, and uh, it's a you know bluesy rock and roll song. It's kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a stretch back for me to the, the rain uh, from the debut album with a little mm-hmm. bit more grit and grime to it. Um, and it's it was inspired by uh, really a conversation Pete and I had in Seattle uh, when we were doing those two uh, two dates in uh, uh, 2018 for the debut album 25th anniversary. That and he came up there with his wife, who's my manager, Amy. Oh, cool. And we just started chatting. And I was like, listen, man, I would love to have a song by you. And, and he's, he's like, what are you looking for? I said, something swampy and bluesy. Russ never sleeps. Neil Young, Crazy Horse. No, no rules. No, mm-hmm. no holds barred. And unbridled. And that's what he sent me on acoustic. And I fell in love with it. And, and um, I said to the guys, I said, I want this to just be one of those rock and roll songs. that you know, sounds like we sold a soul to the devil. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was kind of the concept behind the lyrics. is sit with Robert Johnson at the crossroads. And this is yeah. what you get. Now, I know I'm sinner i ain't no saint and uh and when my time comes let me down easy yeah man that's that, <laughs> i mean and just the fact that you wrote it with chris's brother i mean the, the fact that you know that's a huge name especially in your guys's era of music i mean the whole alternative grunge era and obviously coming from seattle as well too i mean that's that's a that's like a name drop let's call that a good name drop and you guys are writing this brand new material and is is the album fully done or did you have all the stuff all yep. set artwork and all that stuff done too yeah the record's done uh, i finished we, we recorded the record last august so a year ago Oh, wow. uh, and then I took um, I took about four months to write the lyrics and the melodies, mm-hmm. and then I finished the record in January in Houston in a studio in, in uh, Houston. Um, the record was mixed in February, and, and packaging and everything was done late February and ready to go. So uh, COVID kind of you know crushed all that. But the record's yeah. called Wolves. It comes out in, you know, next year, and we're going to release I think maybe one or two more. Sing- Nope. Oh, did I lose you again, Kevin? Did I lose you? I think I lost you, man. It, oh. It's hard to release a record, you know? I don't know why bands are doing it. It's because you can't tour them. You can't support it. Yeah, very much, man. I, I kind of lost you a little bit, Kevin. I think the phone went kind of weird, so. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I'm out, so I'm outside, so I apologize about that. But anyways, the, the record's done. The artwork's done, all that shit, and it's ready to go. Awesome, man. And especially, and I kind of caught the end of what you were saying there about the fact that bands aren't able to tour. They're not able to promote records and whatnot. And something tells me that I imagine that has a pretty significant size on getting new music out there and getting it out to and doing all the stuff. How does that affect not only just your record sales, but also in a way live music in general, and at least in your case? Well, I think it's it's really screwing everything up. Um, you know, I mean, when you release an album in a rock band, you have to tour on it. The rock and roll is the last, I think. The- I think I lost him again, guys. Sensibility, you know, we don't have that. We don't have that opportunity where, uh, you know, millions and millions of people are, are, you know, downloading their stuff on SoundCloud or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it is it's a dying a dying breed, unfortunately, and that's why you got to tour on it. So not being able to do that, it's very difficult to release a record. It's very difficult to support it, mm-hmm. and um, and and you got to be very cautious about putting something out and not having that you know that back end support. You know, it's uh, it, it's just hard. It's really hard. And, and not to mention, you know, we love musicians like us. Yeah, rock and roll musicians love to tour. We love to play this stuff live. And that's what we want to do. So hard yeah man and and you know and like you said you've been you've been doing the jam for years now and um, decades let's call it decades at this point not to make you feel old again but <laughs> i mean this is what you know this is how you make your money this is how you get your artistic prowess out and this is how you get right new music and so when basically a, a pandemic decides to kind of show up and just kind of shut all that down it's like it, it's like a whole new world it's like how do we 
handle this, not only as musicians and creative people, but also, of course, how we how we can put food on the food on the table. You know, it's, it's yeah, kind of, kind it's of concerning. Good. Yeah, it's good. yeah, absolutely. So, brand new album on its way, which is cool. Was what was kind of the plan? Did you um because obviously with a new album, there's usually kind of plans that come around with it too. Did you have plans for touring or or any like specific like maybe co-headlining dates or headlining or what did you guys kind of have planned? Yeah, we had the whole the whole year was booked for us all the way into the spring of next year. So mm-hmm. we were supposed to be out with uh, Three Doors Down celebrating their 20th anniversary, their be- debut album, uh, and sharing, you know, tons of stuff. So it was uh, lots and lots of plans that, that, you know, really got sidebarred. And it, it just sucks because all we wanted to do is get out these, these songs with people. So, um, you know, we're not able to. And, and then next year's going to be, I mean... If there's no if there's no vaccine, you know musicians can't we can't and um, and and venues can't get insurance to have you tour. So it's yeah. just you know you're you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, and it's right. unfortunate. You know, and also there's a big thing going on right now, too, with a lot of the smaller venues, not like the big ones, but a big venues, too, I think count as well, too. But a lot of those smaller, basically mom and pop type of places are really struggling now because they're not able to do what they do. And that is put on live shows. And unfortunately, so many of those smaller venues are closing up because of this pandemic. And it's just, it's just so discouraging, man, sometimes. It's you know? heartbreaking. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And it's, you know, a lot of those venues that we still play. You know, we aren't doing, you know, we're not an arena band anymore. We, we play a lot of theaters and a lot of these seven, uh, 700 to 1,000 cap rooms. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of those are what are shutting down. And it's just really sad that, you know, in this country, the arts are, are a lost art form. You know, in the, I think in the rest of the world, the government subsidizes all of these venues and makes sure that they don't shut down. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and even Canada, for example, you know, they gave every single artist in Canada that's a you know, recording musician uh, a stipend uh, of cash that would, suspend, you know, would sustain them for a year. Yeah. In the States, that doesn't, that's not even possible because most of us are, are self-employed. Right. It's really difficult to get unemployment, you know, and, and um, this country needs to change a lot of things, man. It needs to protect the arts. It needs to remember that, I mean, example is all these guys that, that, that run for president, you know, they use music as their, as their platform, right? Right, yeah. You know, you know, Tom Petty song or whatever, but they're the first ones to cut funding to, to the arts. And it's, yeah. It, it's disrespectful and it's disgusting and, and it needs to change. And it's a bunch of, you know, frankly, it's bullshit. And, and, uh, you know, it, it makes me, it really makes me despise these people as human beings because mm-hmm. it, it's not just because I'm a musician. Look, I make enough money to, to you know, support myself, but I know a lot of musicians that don't, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, uh, and I, and I hate that for them. And I wish that there was another way to fix this, but unfortunately there's not, you know, until the United States government, and, and Congress decides to pass laws that protects these venues and these art forms and mm. musicians in, in general, you know, we're going to see more and more of them closing. Yep. And uh, it's, it's, it's killer. I mean, every single year I look forward to seeing live music. Live music is like the big thing that I look forward to. And the fact that I wasn't able to go to the big rock festival this year or the big thing and just not going, it was heartbreaking for me. But also one thing that I have to consider too, is not only just the musicians, but the the road crews, the people who set up the venues, those kind of things. And it's just like, guys, there's a whole industry out there that the arts support this whole industry. So we need that art in order to keep this part going. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. It is, man. It absolutely is. But uh, hopefully when this whole thing, eventually, whatever the new normal may be, uh, we'll eventually get back to getting all together and mosh pitting or crowd surfing, whatever it may be, you know? (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. That's the hope. That is the big hope. Um, Obviously, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I got a couple more things before we kind of call it a day. Um, When I know you're kind of busy working on a brand new album, which is awesome and can't wait for it. Um, What are you doing on on your off time? Like you're hanging out, you're drinking coffee at the back of your house. What what do you spend your time doing? Are you seeing any interesting movies when you can? No, um, you know, I'm like, look, I'm watching, I'm binge watching a bunch of crappy TV and, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, but I, I do a lot of work around the house. I'm a, I was a contractor before I was a musician. So oh. it's allowed me a lot of time to, you know, uh, to fix things that need to be fixed or, you know, I, I want to take that out and I want to put this there and I want to, 
change the hinges on the drawers in the you know in the kitchen so that they're soft closed. Yeah, stupid shit like that. But um, and I, and I do a lot. I mean, I do a lot of art. I I'm, I'm constantly doing artwork. My wife has a clothing line, so I'm constantly doing stuff for her. Mm. Um, you know, I, I I I keep myself busy just with uh, being a father. You know, my t- I take my son as many times as I can out to get some exercise. You know, in yeah. places that I know that here in Los Angeles that we're safe. Um, but it's you know it's really just kind of being a husband and a father and a and a homeowner and a and a caretaker and you know I'm not I'm not really playing any music. I got to be honest with you. I I know that. We're doing all these cover songs like we did for What It's Worth by Buffalo Springfield. We're doing like 12 or 13 others. But I'm, right now I'm in, I'm in the hold pattern waiting for these guys to finish up the song so I can sing to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, once, once they finish those, I've got 12 songs I got to knock out and background vocals and shit like that on some pretty amazing tracks. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking forward to that. But right now I'm just, I'm just kind of drinking coffee and, and uh, you know, going to the bathroom. <laughs> Something to look forward to every single day. <laughs> Yeah. keep things flowing so you mentioned cover songs and yeah absolutely cover songs blew up it seems like every single band is doing kind of like a unique cover song right now obviously when disturbed did the sound of silence cover thing went everywhere man i mean like there was not a radio station in the world that wasn't playing it um is there like a cover song out there that you're just like someday man we should cover that track and it could be from any era yeah no we're doing uh, we actually have chosen it uh, one of the songs that we've chosen is running on empty uh by jackson brown no way uh, that's awesome yeah because i mean it's kind of it's it feels like you know it, it speaks for the times right now and what's mm-hmm. going on and and you know, i think a lot of people kind of feel like we're running on empty in general and and you know where are we headed what's going to happen here i don't know if i have enough energy to kind of you know figure this out so that's one of the songs i mean i it's one of my favorite of all times and i'm really looking forward to doing it um but you know there's there's so many to choose from there's so oh, many yeah. songs out there that that you know i mean half the yacht rock stuff i listen to like i really want to do low down by boss Kags, man i love that song <laughs> you know so i don't know i might end up doing a whole yacht rock album <laughs> yacht rock with kevin martin right here <laughs> the whole thing man it'd be pretty right candle I, yacht I, rock candle yacht rock perfect I love it. Sign me up for it, man, right now. <laughs> so, all right, Kevin, man, I won't keep you too much. I mean, you probably got to get a refill on your coffee, but the one last question I always ask you, I'm a huge tattoo fanatic, and I see that you have one kind of hanging out in your hand there. Uh, what is that tattoo? It looks like leaves, and do you have any other unique tattoos on you as well? Oh, look, it keeps going, too. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's Ivy. It's kind of out with the old and with the new. I did this, and it's got my son's name on it. Um, awesome. You know, I, I do have, I, I have several tattoos, but they're all kind of, you know, they're old. I've had them for shit, going on 40 years. No, 30, 30 years. Yeah. I was about to say, did you get it uh, when you were 11? Because that's pretty yeah, rad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. 30 years. Um, I got my first one when I was 18. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, they're, they're, they're personal to me. I've got one that says, I can't remember to forget you, which is about my ex-wife, um, which is never, you know, uh, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Uh, right. But yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's tattoos are tattoos. I think they're all, you know, I've never been one to get one just for the hell of it. You know, it's always had to have something to do with what's going on in my world. And, and, um, and that's really why I do it. But um, I love them. I, I love, you know, we've got a lot of fans who have, you know, some brilliant tattoos yeah. uh, that come to our shows. And I'm, I'm always asking them questions about it because I find it fascinating just to see what, you know, what was their idea behind this and why would they get something that was as elaborate or something, you know, that took, 24 hours to do or something like that yeah yeah and you can sit there for work and work and i'm working on a sleeve right now of all like video game stuff because of how inspirational it's been to me over the years and it's weird how you know when i was a kid i'd play video games just for fun 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 and nowadays they're like such a deeper meaning it's like well now i gotta get this on my arm you know it, yeah. and it just tells a story it's just so much more fun yeah yeah that this one's super mario that's his brother, Luigi. Yep. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's how it comes down. You're a but, nerd, Ned. Ah, uh, dude. Oh, my gosh. You don't even know. Oh, you don't even know, man. <laughs> it, it runs deep. <laughs> so, Good. Good. Kevin, man. Stay that way. Oh, I will. And I'm 33 years old and having a kid. I'm putting video game tattoos on my arm. Clearly, I'm staying young somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Kevin, man, dude, it was such a pleasure chatting with you, man, and drinking coffee and such. Is there anything you want fans to know? Of? Obviously, the brand new single out coming, and also brand new album. Anything else is on the smorgasbord too? Just, just remember us. We'll be around next year. <laughs> Please don't forget Candlebox, God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks, Ned. It was a pleasure chatting with you, brother. Thank you, Kevin, man. And I'll talk to you hopefully very soon and see you on a show at some point, man. Let's get to that point, so. damn it. I hope so, brother. All right, now go continue working on your house and drink coffee. I'll talk to you later. We'll see you. <laughs> see you, dude.